Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today on July 6th, 2023, I'm excited to welcome Jeremy Lott to the podcast. He is currently the managing editor of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, but he's also written some Adam Smith comics for Adam Smith Works, and he's written an impressively wide range of books, from a novel about William F. Buckley Jr.'s faith to children's books like this one called Growly Locks, you can buy it on Amazon, to comics like Movie Men. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about a hodgepodge of topics, but we're going to kind of touch on most of these things, at least. I'm really excited. I hope you are, too. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be here. So before we get started, what is the most important thing people my age or my generation should know that we don't? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, So I'm raising two two kids. I have a, a daughter and a son. They're four and two, right? So I don't know about your generation. I know the one before that, uh, or, or sorry, that comes after, and, and that that is the most important thing to me to impart to my children. Um, and that is that, like, you know, if we, if my wife and I were to, like, die in a fiery accident and for our, our finances were a wreck and, and our kids became orphans or something, and, like, what would I, what's at the bare minimum what I want to impart to them, right? You know? Um, and, uh, I, I think that the three things that, that are important are a, a love of learning, uh, and confidence and moral restraint. So th- that's, that's what I'm seeking to pass on. And I think that kind of, I mean, that's good advice for anyone, right? I guess it's more of a, so. of a topic to be familiar with and to have yeah. a, a take on, but that's, I think you could kind of boil that down to general advice for how anyone could and should live a good life is like figure these three things out. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Let's start on a more personal note. Um, you've created a lot of different types of work um, mm-hmm. from what the topic is to the medium. And in my eyes, that makes you a major generalist. Uh, listeners, go check out my interview with David Epstein on this topic because I love a good generalist. Um, I like to consider myself a generalist. So, I guess my question is... I think I think most good podcasters are generalists. <laughs> well, hopefully that makes me a good podcaster then. Um, did you always know that you wanted to explore different ways of creating things or did that kind of just happen along the way? Yeah, I don't... Like, I'm not a planner. Uh, uh, my wife is, so it's good to, it's good to balance that out. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's like... You know, I graduated uh, college on accident, for instance. Um, the uh, but what do you what do you mean? <laughs> like, I, I don't do your own credit evaluations, kids. It's a bad idea. Um, yeah, no, I literally was da- down doing it. So, yeah, this is a great example of how like life happened. You know, um, I was down in L.A. doing an internship at Reason that I would not have taken had I known I had graduated because in my mind it was like and I was wrong about this, but uh, internships were things that you do while you're in college and then you get a job afterwards. Right. And um, so, uh, you know, Nick Gillespie, who was the editor of reason at the time would be bugging me to, to apply for this uh, uh, internship. And I, I did, and I got it and I went down to, to uh, LA and then I, a couple of things that happened at college that were just sort of weird and so I called up the registrar, who was a friend of mine, and I said, hey, Larry, could you do a credit eval? Um, because I think I, I screwed something up, and I want to know exactly what I, I need to take when I come back, right? And you could have walked at my school if you were two classes short, right? And I thought I was four classes short. And he, he said, well, you should have walked after he did the eval. Um, and he, and he said that we did a bad job of transferring you in. And, and so I, I'm going to count this thing in this category and this thing in this category. And where do I send your diploma in courts? Huh? So, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's just a lot of my life that's, that was either pla- badly planned or not planned at all. <laughs> <laughs> but look where you are. 
<laughs> yeah. Turns out, doesn't um, it? Or yeah. turns out well. Or, I guess I forgot yeah. a key part of that sentence. It, you know, it happens. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I... I, I just think that there, there's so much of life that we try to plan that, um, and that sometimes that's just not how, uh, how life wants to, to, to go and, and just go with it. So then I guess like, did you have a, an idea that you wanted to be creating things or. I, my, yeah. my brain, is, I, I feel like I'm, so this is, I feel like I'm just kind of like a normal guy inside of this really big, crazy brain that I don't, I've never quite understand. That's, that's always creating, that's always doing things. And I'm just along for the ride. Um, and, uh, you know, I've gotten better as the years have gone on at steering it in certain directions and that's helped, uh, in creating different things. Like for years I couldn't, uh, I, I, w- I, I didn't do, um, fiction or, or anything like that because I was awful at dialogue and there's just something that my brain that just wasn't processing that well. Um, and finally I was like writing a comic book and one of the guys swore and, and, and I went to change that cause it's like, well, that's not how I would swear. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then I, I said, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Wait, don't do that. Cause he's, this character is actually talking in a way that you view as distinct from you. Um, and, and it was just this like watershed breakthrough moment. And I, I realized that, you know, Hey, I can do fiction now. And, and that was, you know, uh, I, I want to say that was like, my, I'm, I'm turning 45 this year. That was at, at maybe my late thirties, if not my early forties, you know? So one of the big questions of 19th century Russian literature probably wherever there's art, but this is what I've studied, um, is the question like, why art? What drives us to create art and why should we do it? Um, There are generally two sides of this debate. One of them is art is utilitarian. You have to serve a greater purpose. You have to know why you're creating and why you're called to create a thing and what values you want to impose upon it versus art for art's sake. And if it has values and morals embedded in it, then so be it. But that's not why I did it necessarily. So yeah. why did you do I it? I think there's also, I think there might, 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 let's get the right word, <laughs> might be the Socratic position where he, he goes to the poets and whatnot. And, and he says, he says, you know, you obviously have inspiration from the gods, you know, like that's his, his thing. Um, and there, he goes, explain this to me. And they can't, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, see, he's like, artists cannot explain these things. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I, I look, it's, uh, I don't think it's either or I think it's, I think it's both. And I think that sometimes art, like, it depends on sort of what the art form is and how you're doing it. I mean, like I write some of the things I write are kids books, right? Mine are not very message heavy kids books, but a lot of ones that are, you know, successful are, that's fine. I don't, I'm not knocking that. That's just not how I create. Um, now that doesn't mean ideas don't go into my, my kids' books. Uh, Growly Locks uh, was sort of, kind of uh, me. Uh, I've always hated golden mean arguments, and of course, Goldilocks was the the you know creator of the the frame that we use for golden mean ar- arguments, right? And uh, so you know you you have I just flipped it and have like a a bear coming into a human household and they're trying to do the whole just right thing and the bear's like that's insane. So um, you know that doesn't mean that you know ideas don't get into my books. It's just I'm not trying to use it to usually to drive a larger you know moral point. Yeah, um, that's also you just played into one of my biggest irrational fears because I've been pronouncing it. Growly locks, which I guess doesn't make sense because it's a bear. So growly locks makes a lot more sense. Um, the way it's spelled, I can see how you. I absolutely can see how you would pronounce well, it. Well, because I was like trying to type it, and I was like, "How on earth? Like what? I don't know." But it <laughs> it makes a lot of sense now. It just didn't at the time. Um, yeah. I guess like you in part of answer this question, but do you have a goal? overall with just creating things or does your goal with respect to projects go more on a project by project basis? Uh, okay. I mean, it it gets that just, there are sort of overall benchmarks you want to hit, right? Um, like with the kids books, I, I want to, 
there, so there's a how familiar are you, or how familiar are you with their sort of the uh, self publishing movements right now in books? Not that. If you want to elaborate, okay. that would be cool. There, there, there's a there's a uh, it's a it's a Facebook group, but it's sort of a moniker or a, I don't know. That's not the right word. Um, at this point, called Twenty Books to Fifty K. And the, it was the, the head of this group was just mathematically saying, you know, uh, I write books on the regular. I dump them on, on, uh, Amazon about once a month. And that, that's, this is how many books I sell, uh, on the average per book per month, per year, et cetera. Um, this is the bump that I get whenever I publish a new book. And he just mathematically worked it out. He said, if I want to make $50,000 a year on average, I need to uh, publish about 20 books. And I, and, and uh, I need to, there were a couple other specs, like they, it needs to be right to market. So right to like, you, you're not reinventing a genre or something and um, fast publishing, which is close to monthly, if you can pull that off. Right. Um, and uh I'm not saying I'm doing the books just for money, but it, it was an intriguing concept to me. And uh, I started writing some kids books and I, I got some people that I knew from the comic book world to, to illustrate them for me. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to publish a lot of them. And, you know, uh, the, the financial aspect of it obviously is is a thing that matters, but I'm also enjoying the heck out of writing them. That's awesome. Um, what has been your favorite thing that you've created? And do you think that that has been the most effective or successful, if you don't mind my asking, and why? Favorite thing? Um, No, it's it's a thing that I just did as an article. um, And uh, it may, but I'm going to turn it into a a kid's book. So, you know, we'll see. This was a long time ago. This was close to 20 years ago. Um, I was writing my first book called In Defense of Hypocrisy. Um, and I was, uh, I, I would write that at a, uh, the bar side of a bar and restaurant in, in Linden, Washington. And, um, there was, uh, you know, you, it, it wasn't that frequented, but you know, there, there were guests that would pop in and out that knew what I was doing. And then there were some out of town people. And, um, uh, I ended up getting into an argument with this girl over the town's dry laws, which I didn't like, but were not that hard to get around. Um, it was dry on Sunday. And um, I didn't realize she, who I didn't know who she was with. It was like her grandfather. And so then he comes in like he wasn't confronting me at the table, but he was wanting to size me up. And when he learned that, that I was a you know writer of, of books and what and stories and whatnot. Um, he sits down and tells me his life story. Whoa. Um, like very clearly just, he, I think he was, this was, I, he was a very old man and I don't know what, if he was, you know, terminal or something, but my sense is he wanted this story to be told. And so I, I, you know, paid very close attention to the details that I could, you know, keep in my head and then went and wrote it all down very quickly afterwards. And his name, I, all, I didn't get his full name. His name was Jack something. And so the title of the piece was, you don't know Jack. Um, and it was just his life story. And, uh, you know, I, I published that in the uh, American spectator, which is one of the places that I've worked. And, um, at some point I'm going to take that story and just have somebody give art to it and turn it into a, a kid's book as well. That's awesome. Did you have a computer at the time? Was the, I had a computer. I don't believe I actually had it on me. I think in that case, I, I made a beeline. For, normally I would, but for some reason I didn't that day. And uh, so I, I, you know, was like, check, please. And I went home and, and I just typed as fast as I possibly could um, because I, you know, wanted to keep the, the, the details fresh. Yeah, I got to go check that out. Listeners, go check it out. That sounds so cool. Um, let's turn to your work with Adam Smith, because that's kind of okay. how we got in touch in the first place. Indeed. I'm not saying that I don't read children's books regularly, except I don't really. So okay, I'll, I'll, I've been checking them out though. You know, okay, uh, that's a long ways away for me though. So I feel like I on both ends, I'm a few, far a enough from being a child yeah. and pretty far from yeah. being a parent. So we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. But 
Um, at the Open Market blog with CEI, there's a series on Smith, which highlights his most influential ideas, because as we all know, hopefully, it's almost Smith's 300th birthday, or this summer is his 300th birthday. Yeah, we don't really know when he was born, so we sort of approximate it. Yeah, there, I know there are some mass pilgrimages to his grave in Scotland. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a whole thing. Um, we love celebrating Smith. Um, so yeah. I guess like along this vein, what do you think Smith's most influential idea has been? Um, I, you know, he opened up with the division of labor. That's how he opens up uh, the, so his most, most influential economic idea is that um, the, cause he opens up the, um, the wealth of nations, like it's an extended argument about the division of labor and how important that is. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that was entirely unique to him, but he punched it so hard and so long that he made the point and it, it really had an effect on, on policy in a lot of different areas. Um, my colleague, Ryan Young argued that the reason though, that, that Smith was successful, um, you know, as someone who we, we care about is because what underlied all of his um, observations was this idea of empathy, like the that economics isn't just a study of numbers. It's a study of, of how humans work together and how they can do it better. Um, and uh, that, you know, like if he hadn't been a very close observer, observer, observer of human nature and, uh, you know, he would not have been able to produce that result. What do you think one of Smith's most underrated or overlooked ideas is if there's one that comes to mind? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, is, I don't know if it's underrated, but I mean, just the, 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 the story of your, your name of your podcast, you know, where he, he talks about how like science is an antidote to, to, to a lot of, you know, it's the great antidote to, to superstition, but all, these days it's also an antidote to a lot of other things. You know, um, I don't, I don't think that's actually that, I think you've done a good job to make that more well known, but I think that that's not a thing that he has been had been known for before you started punching it. And you just made a comic about that very one. Yeah. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the comics? There, there are a lot of there's a lot of Adam Smith content, and there are a lot of scholars, but not a ton of comics. Uh, and so you made yeah. these with slash for Adam Smith works. And they're pretty impressive. I have been enjoying them, especially the one that relates to my podcast. Um, I guess like what, <laughs> what led you to write these and why did you pick the parts that you did? So uh, it was most of the, the bits that we, the excerpts were offered to me. Uh, Christy uh, Lynn Harpadal, um she is the, matriarch behind Adam Smith works, I believe. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, we used to work together at the Cato Institute many, 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 many moons ago. Um, and, uh, she saw that I'd done some comic book work and she wanted to do some Adam Smith comics to commemorate the 300th. And so she got a hold of me and we worked out kind of what we were going to do. Um, and it was that I would, we, we would come up with the, she would come up with the excerpts and I could veto, you know, if I didn't like something, but I think I said yes to at least mo- almost all of it. Um, and then I would write a script based on it and then she would okay that. And then I would take the script to comic book artists that I knew and get them to turn it into a one page comic for Adam Smith works. And so we did 10 of those. And, um, the one that the I, I the ones that I think worked out the best that well it was a mix that I I liked some of the Paula Ritchie's she did a slice of life thing which was um, basically a modern day version of like Adam Smith's mom tucking him into bed and you know they'd just been to the market and and he's like well why was everyone so nice to me and she's well you're cute that's part of it but they also wanted my business and how self interest plays in that right. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the comic and the, the ones that I that I also like Doug Curtis did the most of these comics, 
And the ones where we could do a riff on something celebrity were those were my favorite. And so the, what we did here with science being the great antidote is we, we took the famous scene uh, in Monty Python's quest for the Holy grail, right. <laughs> where the, there's the whole, you know, she's a witch, burn her. Right. And so they're, they're doing this and, but it's a different set of things they're accusing her of. And so then the, the night just goes through and is like, when you put Mentos in Coke, it fizzes big deal, you know, or whatever. And, um, so, you know, uh, prove he proves by science that she's not a witch. And then, of course, we we had to end with the the famous the sign off. You know the um, uh, well, what about you know the fact that she turned me into a newt, right? And, and he, he says, "Well, you don't look like a newt to me." And he goes, "I got better." Ah, <laughs> uh, go check it out, listeners. Yeah, um, I've really been enjoying them. I, it's it's fabulous. Plus, comics have always kind of intrigued me as like. A medium, right? Like first there's this, which I kind of, I guess I'm asking you about now is like the relationship between the the writer and the illustrator. Like there are two yeah. people, but like, how does that relationship work? What is the dynamic and how does it shape the final product? Yeah. I mean, the, any writer of comic books worth his salt needs to, and I, I, this is almost should go without saying, but it's sometimes it needs to be said, realize that comics is a visual medium um, that yes, words are important, but they're, they absolutely, or if they're just standing on their own, they're going to fall flat. Right. Uh, there was a famous comic book uh, writer named Chuck Dixon, who I was talking about the, sort of the pros in comic books and how it's not very good uh, typically. And he countered by sending me a page that had no words on it. And I'm like, uh, he goes, I don't understand. And he said, a writer wrote that. A writer said, here are the things that need to happen on this page. Like that page wouldn't have come into existence without a writer, even though there are no words on that page. And that was a, an interesting and humbling moment for me. Um, but, you know, the idea is like use the visual as much as you possibly can. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, the it, it really – collaborations vary, you know, like, uh, you can do it differently. In this case, we had full, but not ridiculously detailed scripts so that the, all the three artists could kind of put a little bit of themselves into the pages. And I think that's very important as well. So then I guess like, what is your process? How do you pick what works best as a word versus when to lean on the visual, lean into the visual maybe. Yeah. Oh boy. I think we're almost at like the Socrates and where does your inspiration come from <laughs> thing. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, part of it's, is you, you do it a bit and you make mistakes, you know, and like you do th things that are too wordy and you, and well, I, one of the things I will say is that, you know, I, so I do a, when I'm doing a full 20 page comic book, right. I do a script, I send it to the, the artist and any questions are answered along the way they're answered. The, the artist then will send it back to me. Um, usually without any of the, just the art without the, um, you know, the dialogue or anything else. And almost every time I then revise my, my words, my script downward, like I, I shorten everything. I make it less, um, uh, not a lot less, but a little bit less just because I want to make more room for their art. Um, and so I think that that gets a little bit at your question, but I, I don't think it's a, a fully answerable one. It's, it's funny. I actually, as you were saying that it hit me when I was in high school and professors would say, you have to write this essay analyzing one page, write me eight pages, analyzing this one page of novel of like great mm -hmm. book. And I would always yeah. like roll my eyes a little bit. I was like, there is no way that the author put that much thought into it. I can't imagine someone writing a book and saying, well, someday someone's going to analyze this line by line. So I must write knowing that on every single line, there should be some sort of little thing to pick up on. And then mm -hmm. I kind of realized that the reason why we do analysis, and I guess the irony of me asking you to do to answer these questions with me, me being 
a consumer of your work and you being the creator of your work is that this is I analyze and readers and consumers of media analyze basically to understand what is implicitly known and the image that's in the author's head. Because the more you like analyze it, the better you get the picture that they were thinking about when they translated it onto paper or movie or whatever. And so yeah. there, there's also, especially when you're dealing with something with a different era, there are things that the author says while not meaning to say them, right? Because mm-hmm. the, there's, there's a lot of things that are just assumed and the, the assumptions are, are, will tell you almost as much as what, it, what isn't said or what, sorry, what isn't said can tell you as much as what is. Yeah. It's, it's especially like when I think about Smith, the fact that he talks a lot about sympathy and now sympathy When we read Smith saying sympathy, it means more empathy than it means sympathy today. Like even that distinction tells you a lot about, I don't know, the transformation of language, but also just the way that people talked and thought at that time. And it just kind of, there's a, there's a flavor, but it is funny because to ask you to answer these questions about the things you do when you might not consciously be aware of most of it. And even if you are, it's just, that's my job. (laughs) That's my job as a reader. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know. I just, it's it's a little silly thing I realized. Um, Let's talk about movie men. A little birdie called the internet told me that you actually crowdfunded this project. So can you tell us a bit about like how you did that, why you did that and, the project itself. The, well, the, we, the the how is the easiest. Well, okay, the, the how of funding it was the easiest part. Okay, which is I know a lot of comic book people for because I'm just very involved in that world. Um, and uh, so when I created a comic book, I just told a lot of them, "Hey, I did this comic," and that basically got me within inches of the finish line right there. Um, because, you know, I think we got like a hundred backers or something like that. It wasn't a huge number, <clears throat> but it didn't have to be because crowdfunding is the way it works is you can buy in at different levels. And a lot of people threw in some significant money. And so it got us enough to fund the the printing and whatnot of the book. Um, but to back up the creation of movie men was, uh, I I would, I used to be a complete movie nut. Like, I mean, I, I would go to movies. I think I worked it out to, I would average like 60 movies in the theater a year. Um, wow. And uh, so there was a lot of observation that happens during, because you're not always just watching movies, you know, you're, you're, you're watching the theater, you're watching the people you're, you know, and um, the, so Regal had changed their uniforms. So they kind of looked like dorky X-Men costumes. <laughs> And I was like, huh, that's weird. Um, And I was like, wouldn't it be funny if like they were really like superheroes? And so I was just scratching my head about that. And then the when you go to a movie, uh, usually an usher with like a glow wand will come in at some point and check the exit to make sure that that it's closed so that people aren't like sneaking things and things or people in. Um, And um, the. uh, you know, like at one point it occurred to me, it's, you know, like they also were supposed to kind of do a cursory look at the theater and make sure everything looks okay, you know? And I said, well, wouldn't it be funny if like one of them found a bomb while he did that, right? <laughs> um, and these things just finally melded together in my head. And I, I told the story of a, uh, you know, a bunch of kids that work in the theater. This this kid, he, he, he um, named Nikum, um, he, uh, he's, you know, one of the workers there and he, he goes in to check the exit and he sees what he thinks is a bomb and he yells bomb. And then he gets trampled by people running over him to get out of the theater. Right. Um, oh, and he wakes him. up. Yeah. And he wakes <laughs> up just in time for it to, to explode. Right. Except that he's still standing there. The theater is still standing there and he turns around and the, the dinosaur is missing from the screen. Um, and so what it is, is a reality bomb has gone off. And it it managed to knock like all the bads off the the screens in the theater and they're spread out all over town. Um, And these kids uh, are just like, well, what do we do? And they, they just sort of, you know, being kids, they just run into the the problem and hope for the best. And 
And they find out that there is the secondary effect of this, which is that when they go to confront these creatures, like uh, weapons from the movies appear in their hands and they're able to do battle with them and put them back in the screens. Um, and so that's the sort of silly setup concept for movie men that I, I used to. Um, yeah, so that's that's the the first issue of Movie Men is that, and then the second issue, which will be released at some point, is um, a crossover with another character that some other creators made made called a uh, Spork Man. Interesting. That's a fun plot. Listeners, go check it out. There's so much stuff. There's like so much content to like supplementarily. That's not really a word. You know what I mean? Listen to supplement or yeah to also consume after this because you produce so much um that's so awesome that's so funny um wow i was wondering how on earth you could know that the i mean i guess maybe you don't need to watch that many movies to know that the people who check the aisles and stuff also check the exits but if you're seeing like five movies a month 60 a year yeah did you try like that costs a pretty penny do you try to use those exits to get in hmm? <laughs> i was like how did he know that like <laughs> I, I i will say that i saved money by i often didn't get concessions you know so it was just the ticket price ah so you sneak in a bag of lollipops i had a friend who would sneak in a bag of like 200 dum-dums every single time <laughs> it's great um yeah no I, I i had friends that would like sneak in alcohol and uh, uh and occasionally like a can would get loose and roll down the aisle that was fun <laughs> So children's books, how did you make the transition and why did you do that? Is How has the experience been? I mean, a lot of it is, you know, I have two young children now, right? Yep. And so, and I'm reading all of them, these children's books that, and I, you know, I, I, I've always liked children's books, but I didn't read them as regularly for many years, obviously. Um, and and the, just their similarity to comic books it, it occurred to me. And and when that happened, I realized, hey, I could, you know, I could rope in some comic book artists and do children's books, right? I don't see why not. And so then I, I sat down and started trying to think of ideas for children's books. And, and the, um, the Growly Locks idea came to me, which was, what if it was Goldilocks, but the reverse, basically? Um, and uh, so there's... the the first series that I'm putting out, it's four books. Um, and it's Growly Locks and the Three Humans. Um, that that's that was released two months ago. Um uh it's uh the three feral pigs and the vegan wolf, and that was released a week ago. Um, and then about a month following, you're gonna see the trouble with golden eggs and the tortoise and the dare. And they're all based on, you know, fables. It's called the, the series is called Fantastic Fables that I just sort of twist in some way. Um, and so and it, it, you could look at that a little bit as using training wheels because you're using existing stories and, and, you know, just changing them rather than trying to create something from the ground up. But I've also got some other you know, unique things in the works as well. And it's the bones you have to pick with. Goldilocks and other things that already exist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good way to get your frustrations yeah. out. You say, I well, my, don't know the, if that would work in real life. Well, the, the three feral pigs and the vegan wolf, right? The, my, I have a father-in-law named Len, and he used to work on the farm, and he, he would always talk about how much he hated working with pigs and how just vicious these things are. And um, I think he got attacked a few times. Um, They're and, aggressive aggressive yeah, pigs are, yeah and and they're even worse so that's those are farm pigs those are ones that are not that aggressive really but you know you look at like uh wild pigs in in nature and they're a lot worse right um and so i was like well what if you just flipped the you know the three little pigs and the, and the, the big bad wolf right like what if it's the wolf that's being pursued by the pigs um and so you know <laughs> i told that story so um and you know just things like that um sometimes you can flip it easily or sometimes you you take the existing story and add something or you know you you don't you, you never just retell the same story you always do something at least somewhat different so okay let's go back to adam smith a little bit because sure. i think especially actually after this kind of context and conversation this might flow better um but something that has been like a common theme is like 
the state of the world right now, I guess maybe that's always something that people care about. But it seems recently that a lot of people really think it's going downhill. And sure. a lot of these people that I talk to are policy people. And so coming from you, your answer might be a little different or there might be a little nuanced, different perspective um, coming from a more creative culture oriented side, maybe. Um, yeah. Well, so back to basically the, the open market blog and the stuff about Smith recently, mm -hmm. there was one part that was about how Adam Smith has influenced America. And maybe I'm mm -hmm. just feeling a little patriotic because it just was the 4th of July, but I like the sound of yeah. that. So I guess how much has Adam Smith influenced America? And on the darker note, are we losing sight of that? Is it as bad as we as, as people yeah, there's, say? There's a lot of threads you just dropped there. I know. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Adam Smith's influence on America is undeniable. You look at our founders. Uh, you know, Jefferson talked about how like this is, I, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but like this is one of the greatest works of political economy ever created. Uh, Washington read it. Uh, quite a few. Like they looked, they read quite deeply into Smith's ideas, though they didn't always enact them immediately. The the, the this idea, though, that um, honestly they were less influenced by free trade, though that mattered, um, than they were about some of his other ideas about governance. Um, and uh, also, you know, you know, uh, Smith did. Uh, it helped that Smith counseled Britain when he could that you know you you should either let the colonies go or uh, make them part of a union where they they you know are, are co equals with us basically. Um, and so the, you know, the founders appreciated that. So uh, a lot of ideas on, on free markets uh, in, in America, you know, compared to the rest of the world has typically had much freer markets over a longer period. Um, you know, that comes from Smith. Um, the ideas from trade that eventually uh, predominated here, but not right away, came from Smith. Um uh, uh, you know, the, the, we, there's a lot, there's a huge economics profession here. And I think that that wouldn't be the case if Smith hadn't very much influenced how, uh, economics, um, he, he made sure that economics was more of a social science. Um, and I think that that has made economics more appealing to a lot of people over time as well. I like that. Are we losing sight so, of that? How uh, bad is maybe. America? I, yeah. <laughs> I don't I look I I think that when you're looking at decline the the thing that you need to worry about is um uh the, I there's a saying and I don't know if it's true but it might be true which is that that uh, politics is downstream of culture, right? Mm -hmm. Um and what what you're you're seeing in our our I I don't mean, you know, from Hollywood. I'm seeing like social media. There's this is and and on in the academy and whatever. There's this it's a very censorious moment where you have creators who are, are often very afraid to, to create, uh, to, to do the things that they, they think that they ought to be doing because they're worried they'll offend someone. Um, and, uh, you know, that's having a bad effect on like just less pure good things are being created because of that. Okay. And I don't know, I, I couldn't quantify this, but, but I, just about guarantee you fewer good things in the culture are going to mean fewer good things, you know, in, in, in our politics and our policies. So, um, I don't think that one's as directly uh, tied to Smith as the other, but I do think it's important. Yeah. I mean, I think Adam Smith might kind of tie in to more, how do you, how do you get it back or how do we redirect in an orientation that we prefer. And maybe that's yeah. more, you have to look at the theory of moral sentiments. How do we relate to one another? How do we empathize with one another? And how do we find meaning in human connection? And I think that that is kind of Smith set us up and Smith can save us. I don't know if we entirely need to be saved, but Smith has a lot of answers. Well, we, 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 we could use some help. Let's just say that at the very least we could use some help. And Adam Smith uh, you know, reading deeply into the writings of Adam Smith uh, uh, will cause you to be a, a, a more thoughtful, 
uh, empathetic human being. And I, you know, I read some of Smith before this, but, um, you know, I'm reading more now, um, because, uh, I, I really think that there's, there's a lot there and there's going to be a lot more, uh, coming for me in terms of Adam Smith comics. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you mentioned some of the other stuff you have coming up soon, but is there anything else we have to look for for you from you in the future? I mean, look, I'm going to be publishing about a book a month for the next year at least. Uh, it could go for much longer than that, and um, you know, it's not. It's going to start out as kids' books, but there'll be other things. I want to do um, a book called Fables and Leadership, for instance, um, and uh, I don't know. I. I I think, though, if you plan too far in advance in these things, you're going to miss some things. So uh, maybe I'll also write a book called Against Planning. <laughs> you're going to let life happen a little bit. A little bit. Awesome. Um, I love it. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. And listeners, go and check out all of this content that Jeremy has produced. It is so awesome and also just awe-inspiring. The sheer like breadth of content uh, you will have something that you enjoy i promise i have one last question for you okay what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why okay so um you know the, there's the thing where if you got you know a time machine what would you go back and do and like everyone says they'd kill hitler or whatever mm -hmm. um i'm not saying i wouldn't do that but one of the things <laughs> i would do is is I would go back and I would slap the, the early version of me and say mushrooms are awesome. Interesting. Elaborate. Yeah, I used to hate the taste of mushrooms, and uh, you know, because kids have like uh, texture issues sometimes. Um, but I think I was just being a little punk. And uh, uh, mushrooms, you know, sautéed mushrooms are a, a very good thing to eat. They're like vessels for flavor, and it's like a vegetarian snail. I'm gonna say it. There you go. <laughs> okay, that you, you, now, you, now it's out there. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight. I'd also like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. It means a lot. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests, or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at greatantidote at libertyfund.org. Thank you.